Tonight, or tonight, yeah, let's get started. Let's sort of wake up and see the, what's going on here. Today, we are going to continue our study of the uh, lessons that we can learn from bad people, bad behavior, as uh, reported in Scripture. Today, we are going to be looking at Ananias and Sapphira. We all know that story. We will be starting in the uh, fourth chapter of Acts, about verse 32, in just a couple of minutes, but... What we want to look at here is the, uh, how things were in the early church as recorded by Luke in Acts 4, 32 through 37. What we're talking about here, uh, or what Luke is talking about here, took place shortly after Pentecost. And we know on the day of Pentecost there were 3,000 saved. And we also know that the church was growing very rapidly during this time. And we have a, we have a uh, description of the church in Jerusalem, and this was certainly a, uh, the kind of church that we would like to have. Starting at verse 32, all the believers were in one in heart and mind. The importance of that is that unity. The unity that we, we studied uh, unity several years ago in the form of, of uh, be one of another put ourselves uh, second to the rest of the people. And as, as we were talking about, and as Tommy prayed about uh, being uh, unselfish, and that was very important. The early church uh, also, as we continue there, no one claimed that any of their possessions was, was their own, but they shared everything they had. And that is important at that time. We'll look at this a little more in a minute. But uh, we can see that there was that unity there. We also see with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now we all know that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus was very important. It confirmed him as the Messiah. And that's where a lot of people disagreed with those of the way that he was merely the son of a carpenter from Nazareth. But in fact, the uh, apostles were uh, testifying, teaching uh, the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. And also, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. And we had Dale talked about that this morning, about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the grace that uh, that, that gives us having the Holy Spirit if we let the Holy Spirit work. Now, some people don't. We're going to see a few of those today. <clears throat> that there were no needy persons among them. Now, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone who had a need. Now, that sounds a little bit like a contradiction there. No, there were no needy persons among them. But in fact, uh, history will tell us the early church had some major needs because of Jews converting to the way, to Christianity. They were done in a, in a lot of ways with their families, or their families were done with them. Their businesses, nobody was going to do business with them, the Jews who were left. And as a result, many of them uh, had needs. You can only live so long <laughs> before things run out and there are needs, and they were meeting those needs. And that's what it means that people did not have a need in the sense that it didn't go uh, fixed. <clears throat> we also noticed, we also know that on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000 who were saved, who were, uh, who heeded or answered uh, Peter's message, that he gave that day, many of them were from out of uh, out of town, out of Jerusalem. Pentecost <clears throat> drew a lot of people to Jerusalem. Many of them did not go home, back home, because they were Jews as well, and they had nothing to go back home to, really. Because family was against them, their businesses, if they owned them or if they worked, those were all uh, 
just for all practical purposes, non-existent. Well, again, they did not come to Jerusalem on the day for the Pentecost in order to, uh, they did not think they were going to stay there very long. But we saw what happened that day. And it, uh, again, necessitated people who were in need at that point. Now, sometimes, uh, uh, I've never been in a congregation where there was a rapid growth like Jerusalem was experiencing. But when that does happen, I mean, we've got to stay ahead of, ahead of the needs and, and the planning and so forth, just as a practical matter. So that was one of the other things that was uh, that they were doing, that they were doing it as a unit, a unit that they were unifying. Now, we know that while this was going on and while this was, uh, they were unified, we also know that the Jewish leaders Jewish religious leaders were very active in trying to quell this, this uh, and stop this group. Uh, they considered them to be um, blasphemers, and they would try to get them to blaspheme. And in that way, they could then punish them. And we see just before this uh, scripture here, uh, Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin. <laughs> And they were before the Sanhedrin because they were teaching <laughs> against the Jewish religion. And as a result, they had to be uh, brought before the Sanhedrin. That was the way in which Romans set it up. The Sanhedrin deals with religious issues, the Roman government <coughs> all other issues. And as a result, we see that the persecution was continuing. It was not as extreme as it became, as we know from other writings and uh, just history. We know it got worse than that. Now, we will look at um, some, uh, another scripture here uh, in Acts 20, 35. In Acts 20, 35, as Paul is giving his farewell to the elders of Ephesus, he quotes Jesus as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we know that that is, uh, that is very true. Giving is, and we've all known people who are giving people, and we've also known people who are not giving people. And as a result, uh, we see here that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the church um, at Jerusalem, as it was in, that, in the passage we just read, was a model for the 21st century church to follow. Now, we don't, we don't have quite that as we did then, because... There is not the pressure that was on the Jewish Christian converts, uh, converts to Christianity, as it is today, because we don't have that state or national religion as such. So we don't see uh, if somebody is baptized this, uh, today, let's say, so they, they don't get fired from their job and they don't get their home taken and their family, their family may react to it, but it is not going to be like it was in the first century. But it is a very good, uh, very good example there. Now you're probably wondering when we're going to get to Ananias and Sapphira. Well, it isn't yet. Okay, <laughs> okay, we're not quite there yet. Um, what I want, what I want to look at now is uh, what Jesus said in the garden before his um, crucifixion. And it's important because that prayer <coughs> has God to bless the believers is at work in, uh, in Jerusalem at that time. And if we look at John 17, and many people consider John 17 to be really the Lord's Prayer. The other uh, commonly referred to uh, prayer is really a uh, model prayer, but... He was praying in uh, verses 20 and 21 of John 17. My prayer is not for them alone. And the them alone to whom he was referring were the believers and the apostles. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that of the apostles. And we just saw that the apostles were carrying out their mission in the first century, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you have, uh, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also 
be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And what he is praying for there are, he's praying for us, really, as well, because we are believers. We are believers based on what the apostles said, based upon scripture. We, we weren't there in the first century, as Steve said, we're not quite that old. We weren't there in the first century to, uh, to hear it directly from the apostles, but we get it through the word. And he is praying for us uh, to be one, to be one. And Paul, in many of his writings, wrote that believers should have the mindset of Christ, which is that unity mindset. We should be unified with each other. And we know, and we can put, we can go around the room, and I say, everyone in this room will have a story about what happened in a congregation where you were worshiping, where the unity broke down. We had, a, we had a situation, and this is very important, very scriptural, very <laughs> important example. The roof on the church building leaked. Okay? So the men got together and decided that they were going to have the roof re-roofed. Okay? Well, one of the members got very upset with the waste of money. And you all know why. Because the roof only leaks when it rained, okay? And when it leaked, and this is in Missouri, when it leaked, it leaked. We could cross the Red Sea in the basement of that building with a full of water, or we could uh, cross the River Jordan from one classroom to the other as the river was running down the highway. But, but that is not the kind of unity that we need. I mean, something like that is somebody who had wanted his way so much that he left, he split. That is not the way uh, Christ envisioned it. That is not the way the God envisioned it. And it's not the way the person of the church was to begin with. Now, we're not quite as Ananias and Sapphira. We're making our way there. In a slow mo slow way, but we'll get there. And we all know the story. We all know how it ended. And uh, there were Paul bearers in that, in that story twice. I feel like to be those young men that get to do a twice take body out very. But there have been significant moral failures in scripture, and that's what we can learn from. There are reasons that these things happen. For example, Abraham, the father of faith. Did not trust God for deliverance. Remember, he lied twice about who Sarah was. And then we have Moses. Moses led the children out of uh, Egypt. And he led them across the wilderness. And they were all very cooperative with him, right? The first thing they did as soon as they got to the river, to the Red Sea, was to start complaining. And it didn't end until much later. And as a result, here is, here is Moses, who uh, has been so patient with all of this. God gives him a command, and he didn't do it the way God commanded it. A man of great faith, Moses, a man of, who is one of the, we don't like to say the giants of the uh, uh, Old Testament. And he was certainly one, when you say Moses, everybody knows who, who we're talking about. Then we had David. It was David, a man after God's own heart. And what did he do? He strayed. He strayed. So it happens. And we understand that. We also know Peter. Here was Peter, who was uh, one of the close, uh, one of the apostles close to Jesus. He denied him three times. So it can happen. And this basically shows that um, we are human. Even those who are the greatest, not the greatest, but those who have the, who are a man of faith, a man after his own heart, who is a man of great faith and all of that, there are, there are things can happen. Okay, now, are we ready to go to Ananias and Sapphira? And the class said, yes, finally. It's about time. Or not yet. Or not yet. <laughs> it could be or not yet. What we want to do is read 
one more, uh, two more verses out of Acts, tw Acts 4, and that is uh, 32 through 37, but in Acts 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. All right, here we have, it's interesting that Barnabas is singled out. Luke singles him out. But Barnabas, this is not going to be the first, the only thing that he is noted for in Scripture. This is an introduction very early on of a man who lives up to his uh, name of being the son of encourager he is, or encouragement. He is an encourager. And he, before this church here, this congregation in Jerusalem, came forth with the money from the property he sold. Now, who were members in that congregation? Ananias and Sapphira were there, were there, but <laughs> not there. They what they saw this happen. And we sometimes as we read this, we have to look a little bit between the lines because it's not all clearly laid out, but I think we can infer it. They were basically following, if you read as we read chapter four or verse 1 of chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also, also. So this indicates they did it after uh, Barnabas did it, and it's in that order anyway. Also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, <clears throat> but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, we know that he did not give everything that that property was that he sold it for. What can we infer, however, from what he gave when he gave it to Peter? What he basically said, we don't have it. But would it have been all right? For example, there are people here who may come into a windfall and you give part of it to the church and <clears throat> keep back part of it. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Would there have been anything wrong with it if they had said, if Ananias had said, this is part of the price we're holding back because we need to do a kitchen remodel? I doubt if you would have said that, but I mean, that's that's the idea, right? We need, we need to do something else. But he didn't do that. He did not do that. And just, neither, did, neither did Barnabas. Barnabas gave it all. And that's what this looked like. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Now let's put ourselves in Ananias' sandals for a minute. And I think we would be speechless. Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? I think he's feeling very, that would be a shocker for him. Didn't it belong? And then uh, he basically said, uh, you have kept and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Now, number one, they didn't have to sell it necessarily. But everybody was, everybody was <coughs> helping <coughs> Property did not belong to the individual anymore. They were more of a communal uh, situation. And they, uh, did this not belong to you before it was sold? After it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Well, yes, it was at his disposal. Now, if he had sold it and decided to keep the money, I suppose he can do that. But what he did is he created this image that he had Sold the, they had sold the property and they were giving it all to the church. And we're going to come to uh, when we look at kind of a breaking this analysis down. Well, we can go to that right now. In the Mediterranean countries at that time, and it is true today, uh, when somebody contributes something, a, a beneficiary or a philanthropist contributes, they generally get some sort of honor or recognition. And it is highly likely that that's what Ananias and Sapphira stumbled over. They wanted that honor. 
You know, some people contribute so much money to, for example, uh, if you look over at uh, uh, LCU, you'll see a number of names on buildings. Well, that was not just something that they pulled out of the air, or they happened to see a TV program and saw that name, thought it'd be a good name for it. It's because people donate. Now, those, I can tell you, those who have donated it did not do it for that reason. Their primary reason, primary motivation, is to further Christian education. On the other end of 19th Street from Texas Tech, <laughs> well, we won't go there. Right along. <laughs> That's one we will not go to. All right, but anyway, <clears throat> that was a, likely a motivator. And that is the wrong motivation. Because what are they doing in that sense? They wanted to be praised by men. They wanted to be praised by men. They covet man's praise. And they covet that recognition. And that is where the downfall came. All right, as we go along here, what made you think of doing such a thing? And I think it's a twofold what made them, made them do that. They wanted to help, they also wanted that recognition and that honor and the praise of men. What made you, uh, uh, you have not lied just to human beings, but to God? That is a very serious charge, isn't it? It's bad enough to lie, and we know people who say, well, you got to lie to get through life. Well, I don't think so. But, um, and, uh, and, oh, it's just a little tiny lie. Well, lying is lying. When Ananias heard this, he had a reaction. He fell down and died. That was pretty serious. Not pretty This was serious. This was not something that was just, oh, he, well, you know, he didn't really mean to do what he did. This was very serious. And it was used as an example, as we're going to see here at the, at the uh, end of this scripture reading. It was used as an example to teach those who saw this happen. And, what else? Those who read about it in the 21st century. Or have read about. I'm sure all of you have read about this way back last century. That's what I used to tell my students. I was born way back last century. They look at me. <laughs> wow. You must be really old. <laughs> I had a little girl one time. She helped me out too. I had a little girl one time. She was in front of the grand jury. And somehow we got to, she had been molested by a relative. And somehow we got to the issue of, of age. And uh, so I said, how, how old do you think, or I asked her, uh, how old do you think I am? And she kind of, oh, you're really old. <laughs> <laughs> how old do you think I am? You're between 30 and 35. <laughs> so age is relative, right? Age is relative. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, what a wonderful, you can't really say that for the grand jury, but I was like, a wonderful child, <laughs> as I'm hobbling out of the room. But yeah, that, sometimes, sometimes that uh, sort of thing happens. But then some young men came forward, we're starting, we're in verse 6 now, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. <clears throat> well, what happened last week to Naboth? He died. What happens this week to Ananias and is about to happen to Sapphira? They die. That is a very serious lesson from bad conduct, bad people and their conduct to, well, I don't know that they were necessarily bad. Nabal was. Nabal was bad through and through. And Ananias and Sapphira may not have been bad in a sense of Nabal, but what they did was bad. The consequences were very severe. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. She was probably trying to raise him on the cell phone. <laughs> Peter asked her, tell me this, or tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? 
Now she fills in the blanks that Ananias did not. She says, yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire? Now, who's, who's a co-conspirator, her dead husband, to test the spirit of the Lord? Mm -hmm. Listen. And it's got an exclamation point in the NIV. So Peter was upset here. Not that he could ever get upset, but he was. Um, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Greater, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. What about this great fear? What does that really mean? They learned a lesson and stuck with them. <laughs> Sorry? They learned a lesson and stuck with them. <laughs> they, that's exactly right. This And this is, I know we're verbal. Some people are verbal, some people are visual. But this was vi verbal and visual and made a real great impression. It, and, it, it's, and it's not that they, they feared, as we would think of, oh, I fear going to church because the roof may fall in or whatever. It's not that kind of fear. It is a reverential respect uh, for God and for and for the Holy Spirit, because those are the two mentioned by Peter in this in this passage, and it it, it it illustrates that this is serious business. This is serious business. Now, can we laugh in church? Yes, that is permissible, and, but we don't turn it into a something that it shouldn't be. But this great fear had an impact on the church. Now what I'd like to do, and I know you're all wanting to hear this, we're going to go to the book of Joshua. And you're probably thinking, what's that have to do with Anna and Sapphira? <coughs> book of Joshua, uh, chapter 7, chapter 7, and in that chapter, Joshua chapter 7, we have the story of Achan, and this, we all know the story of Achan, but let's review it first so that we can look at some of, some of what happens that leads to what Ananias and Sapphira did and what others do. What happened was, uh, during the time that uh, this was going, during the lead up to this, we have... Um, a situation where Joshua was leading the children of Israel in the land of Canaan, and they were cleansing it, if you will. They were getting rid of the uh, those who were uh, uh, pagans. They were all pagans, and they were getting rid of the the worship the way they worship, and they were taking over the land as God had directed. And they get to a village, and I'm not exactly sure how this is. Now, it's spelled A-I, and that may be how it's pronounced, A-I, or A-E, or whatever, <laughs> but it's A-I, and when they got there, they lost that battle, and the reason they lost that battle is Achan and others, apparently, had violated the rules on plunder. Plunder being, you can take, when you go and conquer somebody, you take from them. But they had violated the rules. And as we're going to see here, God was furious. He was furious with this. Okay, so now we're right early the next morning. This is after, after uh, Achan is, uh, has committed his, his acts. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes. And Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward. And the Zerahites were chosen. We see we're getting more narrowly down. If you're Achan, you know, this is getting smaller and smaller. We start with all the tribes. We start with my tribe. Joshua had his, uh, and then also he had the clan of the Zerahites, Zerahites come forward like families. And Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. 
Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done, and don't hide it from me. How many as parents have ever done that with your children? You know it's quite safe. You know, I'm, we're raining, God's coming after you on this. But you say, don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. That's what he said. And Achan replied, it is true. He admitted his sin. That's a good first step, but it's not going to help in the long run. It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels, which is about five pounds of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, or one and a quarter uh, pounds, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver and the meat. Two things there. I saw and I coveted. He could have looked at it and left it alone, seeing it was not the problem. Coveting it was. And then what did he do? He took it for himself. And he buried it or uh, put it uh, <clears throat> hidden in the ground inside of his tent. The equivalent of putting something in the basement or under the house or somewhere like that. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. And there it was. Hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua, and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. It's most important to spread it out before the Lord. He was the one who was very upset. <clears throat> then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah. The silver, the robe, the gold bars, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, and even his tent, and all that they had, all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will very bring trouble on you. Then all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned and then, and after they had stoned the rest, and who was the rest? Everybody else, the family, his family. And uh, they they then burned them. Now uh, this is after, of course, they've stoned them to death, and they are they are in a way this is very symbolic of erasing their physical existence. After stoning them, then they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor, or the Valley of Trouble, ever since. And again, we see how easy it is for this to happen. And the lesson we learn from Achan, the lessons we, lesson we learn from and Ananias and Sapphira is about that coveting something. Ananias and Sapphira coveting the, the accolade, accolades from the people. Achan, this, that must have been a very beautiful robe. He gave his life for it. Then, of course, there's an element of greed because of the gold and the silver. Well, this confession didn't save him. No, it did not. And that was the... <clears throat> will of God under the law of Moses. Right. Christ says and, and under Christ it says if we confess our sins it is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But, but you live in that time and God made an example out of them. <laughs> and our sin is just as bad but thank God we don't live in that system today. That's right. Because we would lose a lot of church members very quickly. Yes, we would. <coughs> we would see. We would see. Why is the attendance dwindling? <laughs> well, a lot of them are out there under that pile of rocks. <laughs> okay. But, 
Would ask you, the question, does that happen today? When people covet and greed as God. That's exactly the lesson we learned from. I know, but does it happen? That we covet things? No. That the punishment is there. Oh, no, not that punishment, but if it's unforgiven, <clears throat> if he doesn't repent of that sin, then it can have everlasting eternal consequences. Yes, sir. No, I was just thinking there, there could be uh, physical punishment today for people's sin. Oh, oh yeah. What uh, uh, you know, physical consequences. Um, and you know, sometimes we don't make the connection. Sometimes uh, the whole deal with COVID nineteen is that uh, a punishment from God? You know, people have speculated that, and you know, they <clears throat> people poo poo that. But that doesn't mean that it's not true. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And there are physical, then of course, there are also other <coughs> physical consequences of what, what uh, uh, Jack Cummings used to refer to as earthly consequences for bad behavior. Because somebody robs the bank, we don't just say, we can't say, well, I've sinned, I forgive, and I'm giving it all back. There are, they don't get to be buried under the rocks, they get to be on top, breaking up the rocks. I would, I would By the way, that does not happen anymore. I would go as far to say is that we do not know Achan's eternal consequences from the sin. He did confess. Yes, he did. God may very well have forgiven his sin, right. but he still paid the dealt bill. out the physical <coughs> earthly consequences of his sin. And also at that time, they, that's one I've always wondered. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, even the children who sang. Yes. Did they know? Of course, you know, things that parents do affect siblings. They do. And I've always wondered those things if, if, if Christ died once for all men. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions. Right, yeah. right. I think that's very, it's very incumbent upon us not to uh, make eternal judgments on right. people because oh, we no. don't know. No, we don't. No, we, don't. We, we know what we should be doing based on scripture right and but, then let uh, that be the guide rather yeah. than oh well old brother so-and-so we know he is pretty warm where he is now you got to remember too though it was done as an example for all of israel right and and all uh, israel i mean it's there. a very visual lesson that yes, they it didn't was. soon forget right and and the uh, it was not it was not like trying to teach math to me you could try to teach it and it wouldn't work. This is very clear to anybody. And that, uh, that I think is very important as well. All right, let's, uh, as we close out here, we'll go to Matthew 6, 19 through 24. This is about treasures in heaven. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus says, uh, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is the real fundamental part of this. For where your treasure is, there also is your heart. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, and some translations say generous, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, or some translations say stingy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, either you hate the one or love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I think some people really kind of skip over the word serve. <coughs> Is it wrong to have money? No. But if, if that is our God, if that is our substitute, it is more important to earn that money. Or in Ananias and Sapphira's case, it is more important to show, show the congregation we gave the entire prize, but we, had, we held it back because we wanted it. If greed was a factor, we don't know for sure, but it could have been. Okay, then we move on. To Hebrews. 
uh, 13, 5 through 6. Keep, uh, this is chapter 13, 5 through 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And that then is again, that's that substituting money for God. We're worshiping money. We love it. That's the problem. And be content with what you have. And what does that also involve? Now, Dale talked a little bit about it this morning about coveting what other people have. Be content with what we have. And not wishing that, boy, if I had a million dollars, just think about it. Well, a million dollars used to be a lot of money at one time, but now it's billions and trillions that are more important. Uh, but the point is, we don't want to be coveting. We need to be content with what we have. And this is the important thing here, because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. We may forsake him, but he won't forsake us. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And then, of course, we go. We look also at First Timothy, uh, chapter six, verses three through ten. We'll just summarize uh, the three um, through about uh, nine. What we're basically talking about here is again a good lesson on uh, the congregation. Paul was addressing Timothy to address the uh, false teachers in the area, and. Um, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. And he was telling Timothy about that. But then he gets to the verse 8 there, uh, well, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We've got both there. We're contented. We've got God. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to be to get rich fall into temptation and the trap. It was Achan who fell into that temptation. He coveted it. <clears throat> For the love of money, the love of money, is the, is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. How many of you know of people there are stories about the, the lottery when it first came out and the lottery winners and remember lottery is okay it's not gambling because it's for education <laughs> <laughs> all right all right and the uh but the point is but the point of that is um we saw stories of these people who came from uh, very back, very uh, different backgrounds, but most of them were not. I mean, it wasn't like Bill Gates won the lottery. Bill Gates doesn't enter the lottery, okay? But these people, they had all this money, and then you visit, they visited them several years down the road, and it, a lot of it is gone, a lot of them have been. As soon as they win the lottery, they find out they've got relatives they never knew about. Mm -hmm. They find out they've got financial advisors they had never consulted, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And it, what happened? Well, we said, it's not going to change us at all once we get back from that world tour and get a new thing we need. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be the same people. Yeah, we'll be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After we move into our condominium, condominium in an exclusive part of town, uh, right, and it's all well furnished and designed by and built by uh, a, a reputable builder, Steve Huddle. But, <laughs> they, <laughs> but the point exactly, and it just it's going to return to normal. It is. And every, every time I hear somebody say, "If I had such and such," and I, I never ask, but I always want to say, "What are you doing now?" Yeah, the what you've got because you'll do the same thing. Get more, more numbers at the end of your problem, you know. And then, how many have seen people who say, If I win the lottery, I'll tell my boss what he can do with this job? And then they don't win the lottery, but they still have that attitude when they're performing their, their duties. And, and it, 
get to stay away from people like that is what you want to do because they've got that kind of an attitude. Any other comment? We've got a whole three three minutes, I think. I don't know how fast that is. But any other comments? It's been very good to have them. We appreciate it. Appreciate those online. We say hello to you and goodbye. <laughs>